Welcome to the next video. This is going to be about the hip. So let's start with the case. We have Mrs. Green, an 86 year old lady who's been brought by her carers to the emergency department after sustaining an unwitnessed fall in her care home. The carers state that she has Alzheimer's disease. You're the emergency department SHO who's been tasked with going to see and assess the patient. So how are you going to start? Well, as always, you're going to start with a history. And in addition to taking a normal history, you're going to be focusing on a few areas in particular. Firstly, the mechanism. We've been told by her carers that she's had a fall from standing in her care home. Now in the elderly population, even low energy mechanisms, such as a fall from standing in the care home, can lead to other injuries due to having weaker or osteoporotic bones. And therefore, if there's any doubt, they should be assessed by an ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support Protocol. Have a look at the trauma assessment video for a more detailed description of this. Assuming that she doesn't have this, we'll move on to asking about her weight bearing status. Now this is absolutely crucial. Certain patients have no requirement for mobility aids and other patients require sticks, frames, walkers, or even don't mobilize and are in a wheelchair, especially in the elderly population. Now this is crucial, this gives an idea of the function and therefore what procedure may be more appropriate in someone who may have sustained a fracture. The next is comorbidities. Comorbidities are absolutely crucial and especially in the elderly frail population, they tend to be lots of comorbidities. Now it's important to understand these for several reasons. Firstly, this could impact the timing of surgery and the safety of surgery. For example, you find out that Mrs. Green has atrial fibrillation and takes warfarin. This is a blood thinner and therefore her INR would be higher than the accepted um, range for surgery. Therefore, it would need to be reversed using agents such as vitamin K before Mrs. Green can have surgery and this may delay her surgery. And finally, you want to focus on cognition. Now we've been told that Mrs. Green has got Alzheimer's disease and therefore it's unlikely that she would have um, appropriate cognition to be able to converse with us. This can e most easily be assessed using the abbreviated mental test score. And it's very important to do this as the success of hip operations not only rely on the operation, but also on the rehabilitation and the engagement that the patient is able to do with that. Patients who have dementia or Alzheimer's disease may not be able to engage as much with rehabilitation. And therefore, this is important as to their prognosis and their outcome. So after you've taken a history, you then want to carry out a neurovascular assessment of her lower limbs and examine the hip as well. For a detailed lower neurovascular assessment, please see one of our other videos. Examining the hip, you'd want to look for a few characteristic features. Firstly, all orthopedic examinations progress through a look, feel, move structure, and this is no different. So looking at the hip, you're going to be looking to see if there's any deformity. In hip fractures, the most common deformity is a shortened limb compared to the other side and an externally rotated limb. Now the limb is normally shortened as muscles that cross the fractured site contract and shorten the limb and the direction of which where these muscles run and where they're attached to will determine whether there's a rotational deformity. In this case, an external rotational deformity would be seen. You'd also want to feel around the hip to see if there's any pain superficially or whether there's deep groin pain. In terms of movement, you would ask the patient to perform a straight leg raise. If they're able to do this, it's very unlikely that they have a hip fracture although certain patients will not be able to perform this due to pain, and it's important not to push this or cause the patient any pain. It may also be prudent at this time to give them some analgesia to help with the assessment. Once this is done, you're going to go on to getting some blood tests and also some imaging. Now in terms of blood tests, it's absolutely important to get full blood count, urea and electrolytes, a clotting or an INR, and a group and save 
in case the patient requires any blood products later on. In addition, it'd be useful to get a bone profile to look at the patient's vitamin D status and their calcium levels as well. After having obtained these blood tests, we'd also want to do a venous blood gas to have a look at the patient's lactate. Having done this, we now want to consider other investigations and imaging investigations. Patients who've had a fall may have had many reasons for that fall, including urine infection, chest infection, and may also have other injuries from the fall, such as a bleed in the head, especially for patients who are on blood thinners, such as warfarin. Therefore, we may want to consider doing a urine dip, a chest x-ray, a CT of the head, before doing any other imaging investigations. After having done that, we're going to want to image the pelvis or the hip. Have a look at this x-ray and see if you can identify the abnormality. So this x-ray shows a right-sided neck of femur fracture. Let's have a think about this in greater detail. Here's a picture of the femur. We have the head of the femur, the greater trochanter, lesser trochanter, and the shaft or diaphysis. Now when assessing uh, hip x-rays, we need to decide whether the break or the fracture is extracapsular or intracapsular. And for us to do this, we need to know where the capsule inserts. Anteriorly, the capsule inserts between the trochanters, uh, the intratrochanteric line. Looking at the hip from the back, the capsule would insert more proximally up the neck of the femur. Therefore, breaks which happen within this, or which are termed extracapsular, will place the head of the femur at greater risk of a vascular necrosis, as it is more likely to disrupt the blood supply. Fractures which occur outside of the capsule insertion are going to be less likely to place the vessels that supply the head of the femur at risk, and therefore can be fixed rather than undergo a replacement procedure. Now there are different types of break that can occur at the hip. Let's take a look at these in a bit more detail. We can have breaks which are underneath the trochanters and these are known as subtrochanteric. We can have breaks which occur at the trochanters and these are known as intertrochanteric. And we can have breaks which occur at the base of the neck, which are known as basi cervical. All three of these occur outside of or at the capsular insertion, and therefore are going to have a low risk of placing the vessels applying the head of the femur at risk. Therefore, these are termed extracapsular fractures and can be fixed rather than the patient undergoing a replacement procedure. Intracapsular fractures include those going through the neck of the femur. These are known as transcervical. And those going just underneath the head or subcapital. These both are intracapsular and therefore will require replacement of the head due to the risk of death of the head from a vascular necrosis as the blood supply is likely to have been compromised. So having understood this, we now need to consider what procedure the patient may undergo. As we've discussed, the options are fixation procedure for extracapsular fractures or a replacement procedure for intracapsular fractures. Very briefly, these may be a dynamic hip screw. where we have a screw going across the fracture site into the head of the femur to fix it and allow controlled sliding down the barrel of the plate. The other option for intracapsular fractures is going to be a hip replacement of some sort.
Now this may be a half hip replacement, such as a hemiarthroplasty, or a full hip replacement. The key difference being the risk of a vascular necrosis to the head of the femur. So the key points in this case are to assess the patient, bearing in mind key points in their history, such as their weight bearing status, their comorbidities, their cognition, and the mechanism to perform a thorough assessment of their neurovascular status, to obtain appropriate investigations, not forgetting that other injuries may be present or there may be a cause to the hip fracture which needs to be investigated or a cause to the fall. And finally, to assess the patient's fracture and therefore whether it's extracapsular or intracapsular and which procedure would be most suitable. I hope you found that useful. Please let me know if you have any other suggestions for teaching topics and feel free to below, leave any comments below. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you on the next video.